I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today I continue with Section 5.3 of Coup d'etat by Edward Lutwak. Beginning Chapter 2, When is a Coup d'etat Possible? Quote, the Bolsheviks have no right to wait for the Congress of Soviets. They must take power immediately. Victory is assured, and there are nine chances out of ten that it will be bloodless. To wait is a crime against the revolution. Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov Lenin, October 1917. Since 1945, the process of decolonization has more than doubled the number of independent states, so that the opportunities open to us have expanded in a most gratifying manner. We have to recognize, however, that not all states make good targets for our attentions. There's nothing to prevent us from carrying out a coup in, say, Britain, but we would probably be unable to stay in power for more than a short time. The public and the bureaucracy have a basic understanding of the nature and legal basis of government, and they would react in order to restore a legitimate leadership. This reaction renders any initial success of the coup meaningless, and it would arise even though the pre-coup government may have been unpopular and the new faces might be attractive. The reaction would arise from the fact that a significant part of the population takes an active interest in political life and participates in it. This implies a recognition that the power of the government derives from its legitimate origin, and even those who have no reason to support the old guard have many good reasons to support the principle of legitimacy. We're all familiar with the periodic surveys which show that, say, 20% of the sample failed to name correctly the Prime Minister. And we know that a large part of the population has only the vaguest contact with politics. Nevertheless, in most developed countries, those who do take an active interest in politics form, in absolute terms, a very large group. Controversial policy decisions stimulate and bring to the surface this participation. Pressure groups are formed, letters are sent to the press and the politicians, petitions and demonstrations are organized, and this adds up to a continuing dialogue between the rulers and the ruled. This dialogue does not depend necessarily on the existence of a formally democratic political system. Even in one-party states, where power is in the hands of a few self-appointed leaders, a muted but nevertheless active dialogue can take place. The higher organizations of the party can discuss policy decisions, and in times of relative re relaxation, the discussions extend to the larger numbers in the lower echelons and to publications reflecting different currents, though only within the wider framework of the accepted ideology and the broad policy decisions of the leadership. The value of the dialogue that takes place in non-democratic states varies greatly. In Yugoslavia, for example, the Communist Party had, has become a forum for increasingly free and wide-ranging debates on major political issues. The press and the parliament though unable to assert their opinions in the manner of the American or British counterparts, have also participated in the opening of the system. Policy decisions are no longer merely applauded, but are actually examined, criticized, and sometimes even opposed. It may well be that this particular one-party state is no longer good coup territory. When people have learned to scrutinize and question orders, they will probably refuse merely to accept the orders of the coup, any more than they accept the orders of the government without ascertaining their legitimacy and desirability. In Egypt, on the other hand, the single party, the Arab Socialist Union, the ASU, is still a mere rubber stamp. Policy decisions are made by Abd el Nasir and his associates. They are then carried out by the bureaucracy, and the ASU can only cheer them along. When the question came up of whether the ASU-dominated National Assembly would accept Nasir's withdrawal of his resignation following the June 1967 debacle, an observer pointed out that the Assembly will jolly well do what it is told. Many one-party states are in this position. The dialogue between the rulers and the ruled can only take place if there's a large enough section of society which is sufficiently literate, well-fed, and secured to, quote, talk back. Even then, certain conditions can lead to a deterioration of the relationship, and this can sometimes generate sufficient apathy and distrust of the regime to make a coup possible. The events of 1958 in France were in some respects similar to a coup, Twenty years of warfare, which had included the defeat of 1940, the occupation and, from 1946, the long and losing colonial wars in Indochina and Algeria, had undermined the political structure. The continual changes of government had lost for the regime the interest and respect of most Frenchmen and left the bureaucracy leaderless, since the complex business of the ministries could not be mastered by ministers who were only in power for brief periods. The military were left to fight the bitter Algerian war with little guidance from the Paris authorities, 
because more often than not, the ministries were too busy fighting for their survival in the assembly to worry about the other, bloodier war. The cost of the war, in both money and lives, antagonized the general public from both the army and the government, and many Frenchmen felt a growing fear and distrust of this army, whose sentiments and ideology were so alien to them, and to the spirit of the times. While the structures of political life under the Fourth Republic were falling apart, de Gaulle, in simulated retirement, gradually emerged as the only alternative to the chaos that threatened. When the army in Algeria appeared to be on the verge of really drastic action, far beyond the earlier street theatricals of Algiers, and yet another government was on the verge of collapse, de Gaulle was recalled. He was able to impose his own terms. When, on 29th of May, 1958, COTY, the last president of the Fourth Republic, called on him to form a government, which was invested on 1st of June, de Gaulle was given powers to rule by decree for six months and to write a new constitution. Under the terms of this constitution, presented for consultation in mid-August and approved by referendum in September, elections were held, which de Gaulle newly formed the UNR party won a majority. On 21st of December, de Gaulle became the first president of the Fifth Republic, an American-style president with wide executive powers, but without an American-style Congress to restrain them. The France of 1958 had become politically inert and therefore ripe for a coup. The political structures of most developed countries, however, are too resilient to make them suitable targets, unless certain, quote, temporary factors weaken the system and obscure its basic soundness. Of those temporary factors, the most common are a. Severe and prolonged economic crisis with large-scale unemployment or runaway inflation. b. A long and unsuccessful war or a major defeat, military or diplomatic. c. Chronic instability under a multi-party system. Italy is an interesting example of an economically developed, socially dynamic, but politically fragile country. Until the formation of the present relatively stable coalition between the Democratia Cristiana DC and the Socialist, the DC, though the single largest party, could only rule by allying itself with some of the many small parties of the center, as it rarely pulled more than a simple majority. Coalition governments are always difficult to form, and in Italy the problem became so complex that it resembled a particularly intricate puzzle. If you'd been called to form a government, you would have been facing a set of mutually exclusive propositions. The DC is the single largest group in parliament, but, having only 30% of the votes, it cannot rule alone. If the two small left-of-center parties, the Social Democrats and the Republicans, are brought in, the right wing breaks away and the government falls. If the right-of-center parties, the monarchists and the liberals, are brought in, the left wing breaks away and the government falls. If the large far-right wing party, the neo-fascists, is brought in, all the left-wing groups will vote against the government. If... Dot, dot, dot. So, the ruling party has stayed in power since 1948 without a break, but it has not been able to do so at the same time reforming the swollen and inefficient bureaucracy. Everybody wanted reform, except that the right-wing resisted changes in the structure of local government and the police, while the left opposed any checks on the fantastic activities of the state corporation. Meanwhile, the parties out of power concentrated their efforts on trying to break the coalition rather than on scrutinizing government policy, so that abuses and inefficiency went unchecked. Italians gradually lost interest in the goings-on in Rome, and had there been an Italian de Gaulle, the Republic would no doubt have collapsed. Even without a suitable man, a coup almost took place. The Preconditions of the Coup The France of 1958, and to a lesser extent the Italy of 1964, were both countries where the dialogue between government and people had broken down. But in many, indeed most countries of the world, the dialogue cannot take place at all, regardless of the temporary circumstances. If we draw up a list of those countries which have recently his- experienced coups, we shall see that though their ethnic and historical backgrounds differ very considerably, they share certain social and economic characteristics. If we isolate these, we can develop a set of indicators which, when applied to the basic socioeconomic data of a country, will show whether it will make a good target for a coup. Economic Backwardness In countries without a developed economy and the associated prosperity, the general condition of the population is characterized by disease, illiteracy, high birth and death rates, and periodic hunger. The average man in this state of deprivation is virtually cut off from the wider society outside his village and clan. He has little that he can sell. He has little with which to buy. He cannot read the forms, signposts, and newspapers through which society speaks to him. He cannot write, nor can he afford to travel, so that a cousin living as a city dweller might as well be on the moon. He has no way of knowing whether a particular tax is legal or merely the exaction of the village bureaucrat. 
No way of knowing about the social and economic realities that condition the policies that he is asked to applaud. His only source of contact with the outside world is a government radio, and he knows from past experience that it does not always tell the truth. The complexity of the outside world and the mistrust that it inspires are such that the defenseless and insecure villager retreats into the safe and well-known world of the clan, the tribe, or the family. He knows that the traditional chiefs of tribe and clan prey on his very limited wealth. He often knows that their mutual interests are diametrically opposed, but nevertheless, they represent a source of guidance and security that the state is too remote and too mysterious to be. The city dweller has escaped the crushing embrace of traditional society, but not the effects of ignorance and insecurity. In these conditions, the mass of the people is politically passive, and its relationship with their leadership is one way only. The leadership speaks to them, lectures them, rouses hopes or fears, but never listens. The bureaucracy taxes them, bullies them, takes their sons away from the army, their labor for the roads, but gives very little in return. At best, in honest regimes, a dam or a steel mill is bu- being built somewhere, far away from their village. These projects will not bring them any direct benefit, will not lift them from their misery, but at least they are a consolation, a hope of a better future for their sons. Elsewhere, the poor are even denied the consolation of hope. Their taxes have been spent on palaces, tanks, planes, and all the bizarre things that politicians and their wives need. The urban poor, living by expedience, barely surviving in the day-to-day struggle for the necessities of life, are treated to the spectacle of the cocktail parties, limousines, and grandiose vias of the ruling elite. The mass of the people is politically passive, but it is the passivity of enforced silence, not inertia. All the time, the terrible anger caused by deprivation and injustice is there, and at times it explodes. The mob may not have a clear political purpose, but its actions do have political consequences. The 1952 coup in Egypt, which led to the end of King Farouk's, quote, white telephone monarchy, and to the rise of what eventually became Abd el-Nasir's regime, was preceded by one of these sudden explosions. 26th of January 1952, quote, Black Saturday, was the appointed date of an organized demonstration against the presence and activities of the British forces in the Canal Zone. The poor of the city streamed out from their hovels and joined the procession, amongst them the agitators of the Muslim Brotherhood, who incited the crowd to arson and violence. The agitators succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. The poor seized the opportunity and destroyed the facilities of the rich. Hotels, department stores, the turf club, the liquor stores and fashion shops, in the center of the city which was given the appearance of a battlefield in one short day. Only the wealthy suffered, as these were places that had always been closed to the poor. The middle class organizers of the original demonstration had no wish to destroy their own favorite gathering places. The nationalists did not want to deprive Egypt of the 12,000 dwellings and 500 businesses that were destroyed. They spoke of anarchy, intrigue, and madness. For the poor, however, it was a general election. The voteless poor had voted with fire. Apart from the violent and inarticulate action of the mob in response to some simple and dramatic issue, there's no arguing with the power of the state. There's no interest in and scrutiny of the day-to-day activities of government and bureaucracy. Thus, if the bureaucracy issues orders, they are either obeyed or evaded, but never challenged or examined. All power, all participation is in the hands of the small, educated elite. This elite is literate, educated, well-fed, and secure, and therefore radically different from the vast majority of their countrymen, practically a race apart. The masses recognize this, and they also accept the elite's monopoly on power, and unless some unbearable exaction leads to a desperate revolt, they will accept its policies. Equally will they accept a change in government, whether legal or otherwise. After all, it is merely another lot of, quote, them taking over. Thus, after a coup, the village policeman comes to read out a proclamation. The radio says the old government was corrupt and that the new one will provide food, health, schooling, and sometimes even glory. The majority of the people will neither believe nor disbelieve these promises or accusations, but merely feel that it's all happening somewhere else far away. This lack of reaction is all the coup needs on the part of the people in order to stay in power. The lower levels of the bureaucracy will react, or rather fail to react, in a similar manner and for similar reasons. Their own lack of political sophistication will mean that the policies and legitimacy of the old government were much less important to them than their immediate superiors. The, quote, bosses give the orders, can promote or demote them, and above all are the source of the power and prestige that makes them village demigods. After the coup, the man who sits at district headquarters will still be obeyed, whether he is the man who was there before or not, so long as he can pay the salaries and has links to the political stratosphere in the capital city. For the senior bureaucrats, army and police officers, 
the coup will be a mixture of dangers and opportunities. Some will be too compromised with the old regime merely to ride out the crisis and they will either flee, fight the coup, or step forward as supporters of the new regime in order to gain the rewards of early loyalty. The course of action followed by this group will depend on their individual assessments of the balance of forces on the two sides. But for the greater number of those who are not too deeply committed, the coup will offer opportunities rather than dangers. They can accept a coup, being collectively indispensable, can negotiate for even better salaries and positions, they can create or join a focus of opposition, or as in Nigeria in 1966, can take advantage of the temporary state of instability to stage a counter coup and seize power on their own account. Much of the planning and execution of a coup will be directed at influencing the decision of the elite in a favorable manner. Nevertheless, if in an underdeveloped environment they choose to oppose the coup, they will have to do so in terms of political rivalry. They would not be able to appeal to some general principle of legality as in politically sophisticated countries, because no such principle is generally accepted. So instead of operating for the sake of legitimacy, they would be fighting the planners of the coup as straight political opponents and therefore on the same plane. This would have, have the effect of bringing over to the coup their political or ethnic opponents. In any case, fighting the coup would mean facing organized forces with improvised ones, and in conditions of isolation from the masses who, as we have seen, will almost always be neutral. As the coup will not usually represent a threat to most of the elites, the choice is between the great dangers of opposition and the safety of inaction. All that's required in order to support the coup is simply to do nothing. And this is what will usually be done. Thus, at all levels, the most likely course of action following a coup is acceptance. By the masses in the lower bureaucracy because their interests are not tied with either side. By the upper levels of the bureaucracy because of the great dangers of any opposition conducted in isolation. This lack of reaction is the key to the victory of the coup, and it contrasts with the spontaneous reaction that would take place in politically sophisticated societies. In totalitarian states, the midnight arrests, the control over all associations, however non-political, are all part of the general tactic of insulating the individual who seeks to oppose the regime. In underdeveloped areas, the opposition is isolated from the masses almost automatically by the effect of social conditions. Our first precondition of a coup is, therefore, the social and economic conditions of the target country must be such as to confine political participation to a small fraction of the population. By participation, we do not mean an active and prominent role in national politics, but merely that general understanding of the basis of political life commonly found among the masses in economically developed societies. This precondition also implies that apart from the highest levels, the bureaucracy operates in an unresponsive and mechanical manner because of its un undereducated staff. More generally, the economic precondition excludes the possibility of a system of local government, or rather re representative local government. It's true that in underdeveloped areas, there's often a system of local government based on traditional chiefs, but of their two possible roles, neither usually functions as a representative one. They are either individually powerful in their own right, which means in effect that the commoner is subject to dual control, or else if their power has collapsed, they are little more than somewhat old-fashioned civil servants. Neither of these two roles allows the commoner to participate in the small politics of the village or town in the manner of his Western counterpart. Thus, in an economically backward environment, the diffusion of power, which is characteristic of sophisticated democracies, cannot take place. There is either rigid centralized rule or, as a transitional phase, a degree of power for individual regions that makes them de facto independent states, as was the case in northern Nigeria before the coup. Everybody knows that it is easier to take something concrete than something vague, Taking, talking loosely, power in a centralized state run by a narrow elite is like a well-guarded treasure. Power in a sophisticated democracy is like a free-floating atmosphere. And who can seize that? The precondition of economic backwardness can be tested against the known facts of the degree of economic development of countries that have had coups in the last 10 years or so, and there is a clear connection between the two. This does not necessarily mean that A, all underdeveloped countries are ipso facto vulnerable to a coup, nor B, that the developed areas are never good coup territory. It does mean, however, that only the intervention of special circumstances will prevent a well-planned coup from succeeding in economically backward countries, while only exceptional circumstances discussed in Chapter 1 will allow it to succeed in the developed areas. Thus completes Section 5.3, the beginning of When is a Coup d'État Possible? Chapter 2 of Coup d'État by Edward Lutwak. Tomorrow we will continue with more of Chapter 2, When is a Coup d'État Possible? Section Five, four. I will see you then. Alam.